Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. We're going to look at Comic Scene, March 1982. This is the second issue of Comic Scene Magazine. Before we do, I want to encourage everybody to like, comment, share, and subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that bell icon below this video. It'll notify you when new videos are, are made live. And this will give you a little bit of a leg up on the kayfabe effect. Uh, we heard some interesting stories this week, Ed, about one of our uh, one of our videos went up, and I saw somebody posted copies went from twenty two dollars to ninety dollars yes. by six p.m. that day. So <laughs> subscribe and hit that icon, and you'll be the first person in line looking for the comics that we're showcasing on this channel. Uh, also, let the videos play through to the end. That helps uh, YouTube share our videos with other comics fans who may not be familiar with Cartoonist Kayfabe. It's one of the ways we grow this channel, so we appreciate your help in that. So, Ed, Comic Scene Magazine. I found Comic Scene before Wizard was being published. Uh, it seems random, but I mean, this was a big magazine. You could find this at a uh, on a magazine rack back in the 80s. Yeah, it was uh, published by the Starlog people, and I basically, there were several iterations, right? And so these old ones I saw in uh, just back issue bins, mm -hmm. and it would be with like stuff like Comics Review and the really dashed out kind of fanzine stuff, you know? So I never even looked at it. I think the logo is cheap looking or something. There's something about it that I never even gave it a shot. But as evidence of this issue that we're going to be going through, it's probably one of the strongest trade magazines I, I I ever read. Uh, I would eat this stuff up whenever I would get hold of an issue. I would buy them at the flea market because they were like, I don't know what this one cost, but it felt like they were several times what a regular comic book cost. So when I would find one discounted, I would buy it, and I would learn a lot of stuff. Like, I would usually know a couple of things in it, but, you know, we're going to get into, like, you see a Muppets uh, comic strip is covered in here. Judge Dredd before Judge Dredd is being published here in America. So there were always these items that, like... I probably found Xenozoic Tales through Comic Scene. You know, like there were a lot of those kind of pieces of like, I know a few of these, and then there's a whole bunch of cool looking stuff I've never, never seen on my newsstand. We've got a bunch of issues on deck, and I am very uh, excited to, to, to go to go through more of these. To be honest, um, we did the John Byrne testimony in relation to the Morv Wolfman case that, re that related to uh, Morv Wolfman's ownership stake in in Blade the Immortal and some of the other characters. And the cog in the machine, quote unquote, was, <laughs> yes. was mentioned, the John Byrne cog in the machine. And uh, we sort of were wondering if that was like the first, the first mention of, of that sort of thing. Did, did he say that in a court of law? And he didn't. That was a question that was brought up by one of the cross examiners. And uh, it was the kayfabers who are the other half of the hive mind. You know what I mean? <laughs> you and I, we know what we know. <laughs> And if we don't know something, the audience definitely does. And they were like, nah, guys, it was issue two of Comic Scene. So, of course, we put our heads together, start going through our archives. Jimmy, you got a copy of uh, issue two? Yeah, it, word. Let's, pretty lucky, too, because I don't have a ton of these. You know, it's kind of random which issues I have. But, you know, just looking at that cover, you see Joe Sinnott, John Byrne, Dick Giordano, Carl Barks, and, of course, Kirby there with his uh, latest Captain Victory characters. Pretty strong, uh, pretty strong opener. Go to page one of the editorial. This is issue one, I believe. So you see Stan Lee and Jim Shooter there uh, launching this endeavor. So the last training ground, uh, this editorial, it's talking about how House of Mystery and House of Secrets is going away at, at DC Comics and how that's not a good thing. Like uh, the... Edit, the editor makes some like flippant comments about like, yeah, you might be wondering who the heck reads this stuff anyhow. And truthfully, it, it doesn't matter who reads it because what those titles provided was a training ground for new talent. And and uh, that will that's a sorely missing thing if that if that goes away. Like Marvel doesn't even have something like that at the time. They build that later with Marvel Comics Presents, which grab any issue and you're going to get a couple things by some journeyman guys that you might dig. But you're going to get the first Joe Matarera. You're going to get the first Jay Lee. You're going to get the first of a lot of people who actually didn't go on to continue making comics, but make very, very interesting, raw work in the pages of Marvel Comics Presents. It's important to have that stuff, man. Uh, you and it's embarrassing uh, to get those first thousand professional pages out. So why not get it uh, get it out in some Bush League titles? And that's what the editorial is about. And I think, I mean. 
for a fan magazine, like, I mean, he's talking to professionals. I was going to say, it's very inside baseball for issue number two to be, uh, this is your topic. Like, this had to baffle several people, but also the glimpse behind the curtain of how this stuff is made, where it's like, yeah, we are taking away the training ground, and what, what's the ramifications? Much more a Dave Meltzer dirt sheet rather than a Bill After mag uh, for those following the kayfabe gimmicks at home, man. Yeah, very well said there, Ed. But but it is it is funny to think that uh, you know it's comic scene, it's in Walden Books right next to Starlog and Cinema Fantastique and and uh, Fangoria, and the average person that's going to like a Walden Books, man, they might see. Like, even the cover's kind of inside baseball, I guess, you know? Like, they'll see that and be like, what is that? But it's captivating imagery because that's Kirby and it's interesting. But uh, they probably want to read about Spider-Man or something. And then they're like, who gives a fuck about your training ground? You're right. That is a bold, that, that is a bold move because they could have put Superman big and Kirby down here in the bottom. And uh, choosing to go Kirby kind of tells you, you know, this is a comics. They're being pretty serious about the comics part. You know this. what? I, I, th I think they do hedge in that direction later. And I think that that is probably an inspiration of, like, why I really didn't fuck with it. Because maybe I don't care about the guy from the Superboy uh, TV show. <clears throat> I have an issue of this, and it's got to be from like 93, 94, but it's all the superhero universes that have been launched. That's like their cover feature. So you have like the Ultraverses and the Comics Greatest World, Milestone, like all of them. It's such a great snapshot of, uh, of that era. But uh, We did a video of this one. Seek that out. Type in Frazetta in the search field. I love the ads that we're going to see. As, yeah, as we a, lot, a lot of Fantico. You know what's neat about these um, old like House of Mysteries and Weird War Tales? They're a vestige of like the golden age because you know guys used to publishers used to just buy those stories, yeah. you know, and that's how you would get like the Igor and Eisner shops or the Kirby and Simon shops, where it's like we just create stories and sell them, and then store, uh, publishers would have like inventory of those stories. That's kind of what these are like. Um, you know, it's a new talent. Give them a story to draw, and we'll put it in the desk, and whenever it comes up, we'll, we'll publish it. And it just doesn't work that way anymore. Just but a little bit of legacy there. Just because you brought that up, I might forget about it by the time we get to the Joe Sinnott. If you want to flip, that's fine. Uh, but um, Joe Sinnott talked about how there was a dark period of Marvel, of Timely Atlas, where they didn't buy new work because they had such a backlog of stories that they could just um, dust off and, and yes. publish in their... That in happens romance. a lot. Like, when things go away in the, uh, you know, like, 54... Yeah, that's what a lot of the publishers like why there was no work for any cartoonist because it's like, well, we've got a closet full of these and we can't sell books anymore. Right. Like, we just don't need more stories. Um, our first letter, Jim Shooter weighing in, you know, setting the record straight on some of Marvel's influence, uh, you know, taking a lot of credit for the direct market going to Marvel, largely responsible for the birth and growth of the direct market. This is uh, this is classic Jim Shooter. You yes. Know? Um, but these first issue comments, this is pretty much comics prose. I think this is Marv Wolfman, and it's signed on page 24, but I believe this is Marv Wolfman writing in. Uh, but it's just comic prose sort of going, hey, comic scene's good. He, he, yes. Um, one of the things that I took from this magazine, from this reading, and we'll get it here with DC <clears throat> uh, Rocks Industry with Royalty Program, a, a lot of Paul Levitt's uh, talking in here. Um these publisher, Jim Shooter, editor in chief over at Marvel, uh, Paul Levitz probably had the title of publisher at, of uh, of DC Comics. Um, these people are staking new ground in comic book publishing, and they are doing due diligence, going to the outside world, seeing how how um, the the business model of regular book publishers they're trying new formats in this era jimmy what's the what's the date on this magazine uh march 1982 okay uh they're they're laying all this groundwork to to grow the kind of publishing endeavor like these are these are these are publishers they they're acting as publishers they are doing the things that publishers do to to grow viable business it's, it, they're not handling it as uh, a license forms or things like this, like Paul Levitz, when he's talking about the 8% royalty that will be cut uh, amongst the creatives, the writer, penciler, and inker, uh, one, of his, one of his ideas for incentivizing these people is uh, that at this point, you know, you got to hit a certain mark. You got to hit 100,000 copies. Mm -hmm. you, start get, you start getting that royalty. Perhaps incentivizing people to hit those marks, maybe they're going to stretch themselves a little bit and try to do some of the best work of their careers to try to hit those numbers. So not, not half of his comics hit that, hit that mark. And he's envisioning that maybe all of them will. 
uh, after after a certain amount of time. But he's also even doing like you know comic book artists and creators. We're the last people to get paid when we make our shit, man. It goes to the distributor. The stores make their money over time as they sell the thing. Uh, when there's evidence that books are not going to be coming back into the publisher as returnable or whatever, uh, then the distributor finally cuts the final check to the publisher. Publisher gets their nut out of it, and then you, the creator, get yours. So that is one of those things with this incentive program where Paul Levitz is backdating it even. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting uh, concept for them. So when this is announced some of these creators are getting their checks about the time the program's announced because of that backdating. Uh, and, and, you know, he explains all of that. One of the uh, interesting breakdowns, so they, they give an example for uh, New Teen Titans, for example, and, and pretty much they're splitting this stuff up, the royalty, between your writers and your artist. And uh, so Marv Wolfman would receive 50% of that royalty, while Perez and Tang Hall get 25% each, which is... Pretty wild when you think about it. Your penciler and inker are getting the same cut, and the writer's getting the combination of penciler and inker. I feel like that may have been adjusted over the years, because uh, that's not how I would divide that up. Especially, this is George Perez mm-hmm. that's the example. Mm-hmm. The guy who draws 400 characters on a page. Right. Yes. Uh, and Marv Wolfman can simply type... Draw 400 characters on the page, please. <laughs> exactly. And uh, Shooter, of course, weighs in and says, you know, he's been working on this too, and it's Marvel's going to have one of these. And so interesting implications. You mentioned about the books will get better, hopefully, presumably, if there's some incentive. But the other thing that they speculate on is that some of these smaller publishers like Pacific will no longer be able to woo many of the top talents away. So they may go They may go away. The The tenor of this entire magazine uh because things like nexus are mentioned Mm -hmm. and stuff like that throughout this magazine the tenor of the magazine is that you don't even want to be in the indies like you want to be at marvel in dc and when they bring up nexus they're talking about people who are aspiring to be marvel dc jobbers like the idea of being an independent was kind of just a bush league triple-A baseball kind of idea. Before we split, though, I, I do, like, I, I feel like you buried the lead a touch with the Jim Shooter stuff because it was salesmanship wrestling style in here where Jim Shooter's like, you know what? I don't think we're going to be able to match the DC royalty <laughs> system. We're going to beat it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's selling cars on the side. <laughs> couple of new series announced here. Uh, this one's noteworthy because it's a, it's a piece of the Cap- Death of Captain Marvel graphic novel, which is coming up, and I think we'll get to the, uh, the graphic novels later in this issue, something new. I keep thinking about, this is still early days in the direct market, you know, so when you talk about indies and stuff, it's the, like the whole landscape's changing, and this magazine is coming out at an interesting time in comics history and that it can take that into account. Yeah, it's true. Uh, this is such a huge comic, and it um the first one didn't sell much at all and when uh you know how it goes like if you order heavy on issue number mm-hmm. 1 like your your orders for number 2 are going to be a small percentage of that so this thing became gangbusters flew off, flew off the racks and issue 2 the Quin, the death of Quinn the eskimo that had to get pushed into reprints really quickly and if you would look in like the old wizards and stuff the reprint was as valuable or sometimes i think it was like considered more valuable in the first print of issue two for some reason. And by the way, um, this comic is not mentioned. Not mentioned, not at mentioned all. in the text. <laughs> <laughs> Remember how cheap that looked, man? I didn't realize that the... It says t- TV bound. Uh, I guess it's from the movie. Um, the, the, the Bridget Bar- Adrian Barbeau uh, flick. Yeah, it must be. Because there was a TV show, but I don't think it was till like much the 90s, later, right? Much yeah. later. It would come on after Rasslin'. Yeah, I used to watch that, I guess, that movie. I don't know if that was on, if that found, like, a Saturday afternoon there were slot several. or what. There was the Adrian Barbeau one, but there was also the Heather Locklear one. Was that the sequel, the Heather Locklear well, one? Well, yeah, that's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, There's yeah. a, couple, a couple of Swamp Thing flicks. Yeah, I, I remember digging it, man. Like, we were so starved for anything that looked interesting. Between, it, like, being a fan of monster movies, like, Swamp Thing was perfect. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with, man. And once again, like, that, that is, that's the early, probably, you know, the Alan Moore Death of a Thousand Paper Cuts, like, that shit wouldn't have happened. That that wasn't made on Bernie Wrightson, mm-hmm. Len Wein strength, man. 
Dude, Swamp Thing based on that could have been amazing. Because yeah. it would have been like a horror. You know, it would have been, been like a classic horror kind of movie. Yeah, some Dark Shadows <clears throat> type shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pacific update. We get the first mention of Dave Stevens' Rocketeer coming on. Uh, pretty interesting considering what that turns out to be. And at this point, it's just like, hey, we have a hotshot artist, everybody. You know, like, like you have no idea the legacy that is going to come out of Dave Stevens' Rocketeer yet. There's a, gl- there's a glimmer. <clears throat> there's a glimmer. There's hope. There's thoughts that this is going to be something special. So they're doing some, some upfront promo work. Like, listen, it's going to be in two issues of Star Slayer. You guys dig it. Like, we're going to do more. Another thing they mention, and I'm going to have to go through the archives, <clears throat> dude. You want to you want to drop it on their head? Sure, yeah. Masters of Kung Fu issue that Dave Stevens drew a couple of years prior to this. I, we talk all the time about Masters of Kung Fu being this pretty cool series. So apparently, there's a Dave Stevens in there. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, there's crazy stuff. That I think the first Mazzucchelli. Yes, Francois Mollet colors two issues. I have those issues, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's it's uh, interesting. Like this piece itself, just a lot of good stuff in there. I don't have much to say about the Titans miniseries that are planned. They're going to do a bunch of, like, standalone issues. I don't know if that actually came out or not. But Frederick uh, Wortham's obituary. Yes, a couple of obituaries in this gimmick. Seduction of the Innocent author mentioned there. An infamous figure in comics history. Yeah, whenever we talk about... Because you know how the internet works, man. Uh, You know, I like the color orange. What do you mean? You hate the color purple? Fuck you! (laughs) So, this is cartoonist kayfabe. We talk comics, man. And uh, whenever he's mentioned... There is a douchebag out there that has to like tell us about all the other great works he's done in the in the universe, but that doesn't matter. He fucked up uh, the comics industry and set it back, uh, you know, de- by decades with sticking his beak in the gimmick. Born in the eighteen hundreds, isn't an that old crazy? Dude. Yeah, man, it kind of blows my mind. How about this, Fanico? This is a publisher and a comic retailer and apparently a distributor on some level out of Albany, New York. But it's cool to see, like, what they're pushing, you know, like, what would have been the interesting, noteworthy indie comics at that time. And you've got Robert Crumb's Weirdo, Robert Crumb Checklist, Spirit Magazine, Will Eisner represented there, Nexus Number 1, and uh, Zippy, Bill Griffith's uh, Zippy collection. So kind of a cool uh, snapshot, again, of that early direct market and what's coming out. Like, what are these, uh, you know, popular books? And you'll see, like, Dazzler and Daredevil, Captain, Captain Victory. You know, it's there's still uh, some mainstream stuff in there. Yeah, Skull, that, that'd be uh, Greg Irons and stuff would be in there. Maybe, maybe a little Richard Corbin. Yeah, it's quite a mix once you get like those undergrounds mixed in with some X-Men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of funny, Moon Knight number one. They talk uh, overground and underground is a phrase that they use a lot in here. Yeah, 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 and, and ground level. Yes, yeah, it's it's kind of neat to see that because that was never part of my lexicon, but we've heard other other creators mention that. So your other obituary, Wally Wood, 1927 to 1981, kind of lay out his career here as well as reprinting his eulogy that Joe Orlando delivered, uh, you know, at his funeral, um, reprinting that, you know, verbatim. Beautiful uh, obituary, I would say. Um, handled, Handled really graciously. And, of course, as you're reading, you're like, you know, this is a comic magazine. We have Wizard on the Mind. How are they going to fuck this up? And I think they handled it as 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 well as one can yeah it's uh it's 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 again it's one more piece that makes this particular issue kind of amazing like talk about a snapshot of comics history represented there and you can see four columns devoted to him as it should be maybe even another page would have made sense but they do cover uh they cover his story you know his biography pretty clearly there uh so we got our news items here, man. Uh, Larry Gonick is is going ham on issue six of the cartoon history of the universe, which is like really never talked about, but it is one of the first books to transcend comic book shops and make it into uh, proper bookstores. Like that would be there, you know, as an original kind of collection alongside comics, Dilbert's and, and Garfields and stuff like that. I mean, at this point, it must have sold millions. And, and he's created a whole cottage industry of the cartoon history of mathematics and time and all kinds of other stuff. Um, Kitchen Sink is advertising gay comics. And I mentioned that because Howard Cruz is a contributor. Yeah. Has an article later in this issue. Yes. Yeah. And that, that's a series that uh, the way that I even discovered that was, I believe, in ads in the back of uh, Image Comics... And it would be like issue 40, 50, wow. you know, like so, like so many issues of that. And you just do not 
see those in the wild. They, they, maybe they're worth a lot of money, uh, but you just, I've never seen an issue like digging through back issue bins. There are these books that I feel like the people who read them are outside of, say, the direct market collectors. They're not bag and boarding these books, you know, like they're actually reading them. And those do disappear from like the back issue bins because they get circulated amongst like non comics, you know, people that are outside that, that kind of comic shop uh, world. Edge of Comics, Hiroshima number two. Yeah. This is, uh, this is uh, Jen of Hiroshima number two. Like, this is a book that we've talked about a little bit, and uh, I actually found a copy uh, when we were in Hawaii, mm-hmm. but very, very early manga. Yes. You know, some of the earliest that's come in here tra- in translation. Raw three. We have videos of Raw one and two, man. I think it's high time we go uh, show off Raw issue number three. It's incredible what they call out. Like, Joe's Bar, the Munoz uh, Sampea story, Jimbo by Gary Panter. These are, you know, Charles Burns, Dog Boy one pager in there, Mouse, like mind blowing for 1982. Who knew any of these books at the time? This really, uh, this is a bleeding edge period of comics. And, you know, like the Marvel graphic novels are going to be starting up. Robert Williams. You might know him from Appetite for Destruction uh, album interior artwork. One of the, one of the Zap. But, uh, yeah, one of the. One of like the juxtaposed magazine type guys, you know, that really I mean, he, went from he, like he founded the magazine from from that uh, lowbrow kind of position and, and making stuff mainstream there. Joe Sinnott, their first feature article in this issue, we're looking at Joe Sinnott, kind of a profile of his career, really is is what this issue is talking about. His uh, background began penciling and inking, and of course, we all I think know him, you know, as an inker. And uh, one of the great Jack Kirby inkers, but has done a lot more than than that, as the article points out. Comics is a weird, weird business, man. And one of the just trivial, fun, interesting things that I learned from this article was he's known as Jack Kirby's inker. Worked with him for a decade and a half or so on uh, Fantastic Four. Didn't meet the man until five years after Jack Kirby left Marvel, 1975, just randomly at a comic convention. How bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, like, calling outside of your area code was an expensive proposition, man. Ask my mom whenever the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, NES game was, was due out and I was calling up to Altoona <laughs> to try to like, find a copy. Ask her about that, man. Uh, but, so, like, I bet that these guys didn't even, like, talk that much. Yeah, it, it, it certainly seems that way from these kinds of articles, for sure. And he kind of goes through some different artists and talks about, you know, their different approaches and, and inking different guys. Number one, Kirby. Number two, John Buscema, because he's a little bit loose. Yes. It's funny, too, that this stuff comes up. Like, I, I feel like we're going to see that name again later in this issue with the same kind of talk about, like, the difference between breakdowns and penciling. Um, but these same, it's a very short list of like who you need to know to talk comics in 1982. So Marvel introduces new contracts and these contracts are specifically aimed at the Marvel graphic novels. Yes. Cartoonist Kayfabe is sponsored by us and the comics that we make. So please support our latest comics. The best way to support this channel, starting with my next book, Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness. These will be in your stores in March and in April, respectively. These are the main covers here, retelling the history of the Incredible Hulk. Uh, 500 plus issues, 10,000 plus pages retold in two oversized issues with some really great variant covers to choose from, including Ed Piscors, Marcos Martin, Peach Momoko, and whenever we get into the Hulk Grand Design Madness, Jeff Darrow, Ed McGinnis. So let your co- comic shop know you want these. And uh, it's March, Ed. These are going to be out in stores any minute now. So start picking those up. Speaking of, available now. New season of Red Room by Ed Piscor. Trigger warnings. Red Room Antisocial Network, the collection. Both of these are now available in comic shops all over the world. This is the main cover for Trigger Warning starting the uh, 2022 season of Red Room. Uh, If you like violence and and depravity, we're about to up the level of that and uh, start looking for Red Room Trigger Warnings number two. This is the cover to, uh, to seek out. That'll be coming to your local store in April. You can also pick up our back catalog from Ed Piscor, WYSIWYG, Hip Hop, Family Tree, Four deluxe oversized volumes available, as well as box sets telling the history of hip-hop. The book that started the Grand Design craze, X-Men Grand Design by Ed Piscor. Three oversized, treasury-sized edition volumes available telling the complete history of the X-Men. 
and my books that are still available in print everywhere books and comics are sold. The Plain Janes, the first young adult graphic novel here in America, and Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. Uh, there was a news item that Jim Starlin is, or, or maybe it's here, Jim Starlin's supposed to be doing two of these graphic novels, and uh, of course that's The Death of Captain Marvel and A Dread Star. Yeah, and and the way that you know, the work for hire is is a important distinction that that mm-hmm. gets mentioned and stuff. So so Dreadstar is his copyright, and he gets he gets all of the rewards of this program, which which you might want to uh, go go through uh, bit by bit. Um, but like the work for hire thing, because it's already established characters with Captain Marvel and you know the entirety of the Marvel universe on a page or two. Uh, that's work for hire. Like you, you might not get foreign and and shit like that. But like when I when I read this bar, at first, because I like my eye went there first. I just see Marvel introduces new contracts, right. and my eyes go there first. And I'm like, they fucking dialed shit back so much because we don't get any foreign. Uh, we don't we don't get a lot of that stuff. And then it is very specifically in relation to that Marvel graphic novel system, of like what forty. 50 books. Yeah, and I think that you that you also get a sense of like this is their first venture in this direction. These kind of terms I think are constantly being up, updated and revised and things depending on, you know, like we talk all the time about McFarlane's Venom, whatever he's got there versus Liefeld's Deadpool. And you know, those are a couple of years apart those characters, like like not very many, maybe a year or two and it seems like they have different uh different rights to those characters or different, you know, different uh contract terms and and so far as what the artists receive. You mentioned work for higher ed. There's a piece here about Neil Adams was working on an X-Men graphic novel and pulls out because he was so unhappy with the work for higher terms. They talk about the copyright laws from 1978, which, you know, like these are issues that are still around today. Like this is what everybody is still continuing to fight over some of this stuff. And you see it being addressed a little bit here as we start to get into like, well, can we improve comics in a way for the creator? So very early work in that direction. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's so early that it's called royalties, uh, which it is absolutely not called now, because that is also an important distinction, I think, legally, perhaps. Uh, they call them incentives, uh, with the idea that they don't got to give you fucking anything. I'm going to run through what the artist receives real quick. 8% of cover price, that's the uh, set advance on royalties. Um, if it goes into the mass market, 6% on the first 150,000, 8% over 150,000, 10% of amount received for export copies, 50% of overseas sales. I guess that's licensing if they were going to do a French edition, uh, as opposed to just export sales, uh, 50% of licensing, which that one seems pretty generous. Uh, you know, get your dread star figures and, uh, let Marvel do the paperwork on it. 5% 5% of mail sales, 4% of remainder if not sold under cost, uh, 50% for reprint, original art insured up to $1,500. Um, we'll get a little bit more original art later. When we get into the Kirby article, that was something that he fought for to get that original art back. So we take a lot of this stuff for granted. It, like, this is when it's happening. Yeah. And Epic Illustrated existed before the graphic novel program. So mm-hmm. some of the stuff that... A little bit of creator ownership was already in place. Yeah, I feel like that's come up with uh, when we talked to Steve Bissett and Rick Veach, because I think they both did some stuff with Epic Illustrated. Absolutely. That was in the um, the aftermath, in my mind, of heavy metal, and seeing, like, oh, there's different ways to do this. So what they say is, Epic Illustrated introduced contracts so that the company bought first printing rights only. Um, you know, we've, we've heard those guys talk about the value of having their copyright. Yeah. And you see it. You see the stuff reprinted. You know, Rick Veach has reprinted a lot of that work over the years. All right. Uh, around the world, <laughs> Judge Dredd. So I've been uh, looking at Judge Dredd a lot lately, and it feels like this is so early in Judge Dredd in America. This is before the Eagle series starts. That'll be in 1983. But there are a couple of pieces of Judge Dredd comics that are slipping out early. There are annuals. They say 1981 and 1982, but I believe the 1981 annual is printed in 1982. So 1982, I think, is your beginning. And then there's like uh, Chronicles of Judge Dredd, which would uh, reprint different stories. And that starts around like 1982 as well. Good shops would get the Titan books. Good shops would get 2000 AD. So it's not like it was invisible here. Uh, I... 
however Eagle worked, Fleetway worked, maybe they just had, you know, print facilities here, whatever. So people knew it, you, you saw it, but now some of that British talent is coming to DC Comics, uh, Brian Bolland being one of them. And when you see, when you first see a Brian Bolland piece, man, like any of his earliest covers or whatever, this is a fully formed artist. I'd be curious where the heck this guy came from. And they give us some scoop on that. Yeah, that Boland is such a good bridge for this kind of work because you do, it's, it sucks you right in. Like I, I'll see little bits and think Paul Galassi, like it just feels like something I want more of. So kind of the perfect ambassador if you're going to introduce, uh, you know, this character to an American audience. I don't know if you could do any better than Brian Boland. Yeah, I agree. And I think we're going to say that again later today in our recording <laughs> session. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Fun character, though, and uh, kind of ahead of the curve. When you think of the popularity of these violent characters, say, in the 90s, the Wolverines and Frank Castles and stuff, I mean, Judge Dredd's there. You know, like, he was that from the get-go, and it's like, and maybe leading the way for some of these American anti-heroes. Bolin talks about it, too. He, he describes that, you know, it took a little while to sort of find the footing of, like, what, what Judge Dredd was. He was handled like a robot. Uh, at at the beginning, and the you know solidified into the idea of, you know he's gonna arrest you on the street for you know having too much sugar in your house, and uh, there could be a fan of Judge Dredd who's standing on the sidewalk and is like, yeah, Judge, get him, but accidentally steps onto the pavement <laughs> like the asphalt, and Judge Dredd looks at him and, and fucking arrest him for jaywalking. Right. <laughs> but also Brian Bolland is talking about like. I don't know how I feel about this character because it's a little boys reading this comic. And if they're cheering Judge Dredd on and thinking that like this is the way to be, like that's not a good thing. Right. And and I read these comics differently as a kid than I did grow like I didn't see the humor in it really as as a kid. I'm just like, oh yeah, it's a pretty hard future to live in with, <laughs> with uh, you know, too, you have too many lollipops. Yeah, you take this too seriously, man. This is the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mike Mc McMahon getting a call out here, too. Another one of those early Dread uh, artists who would do a fair amount of work here in America. Pretty much, you know, did the first published strips, man. I think Escarza created the, the costume, but Mick mm -hmm. McMahon really did the first batch. Man, just the description of some of the stories make it sound so cool. Love this comic. And, and those eagles, uh, I was grabbing those at, at uh, Kmart before the flick came out. And first off, perfect title. That title was up there with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or mm -hmm. Hellboy. You know, yes. it's, like, it's like one of the great titles in, in comic books. Amazing costume. Uh, imagine drawing this. Like, I know you did that one cover or whatever, but imagine drawing this fucking comic with this eagle on the shoulder. And guess what, guys? Judge Dredd is just one of many Dredd, uh, judges. So you might have to draw five of those guys in a panel. Fuck that, man. I, I was thinking of that reading this article, because I love the character, but it's real work drawing him. Yeah. It's not an easy costume. They didn't get that memo on, hey, uh, Kyle Baker, you, you guys, <laughs> you got to draw this over and over. And, Cut and, back on some of the some of the trim on that costume. And imagine, Jimmy, weekly comics. Yes, that's a weird one. Um, totally, they, again, it's one of those things where, like, you, you have these, like, different markets, because all of the British... History seems to be that way. Yeah. Of, of these like short anthology kind of pieces for everything, even the popular series, you know, before 2000 AD. Uh, I like this ad for the Comics Buyer's Guide. Like this was a huge, I mean, this was your sort of keep everybody informed. This is the internet of comics before the internet. And this is when it was called the Buyer's Guide for Comics Fandom. Uh, I think this is that Alan Light guy and the first issue of the Comics Journal, whenever it became the Comics Journal, the entire issue was devoted to how this guy like Jack's his uh his readership and it shows bounced checks or or <laughs> checks that are cashed but like no, nothing was received for that stuff man so these are neat i don't see those in back issues very often uh, you know like they're newsprint and they just fall apart so more of our letters uh noteworthy the late tom veach we uh we lost him recently so you know guy uh, a creator there weighing in on uh on his thoughts on this new magazine Kirby article. Surprised they uh, waited this long to get to Jack Kirby. Yeah, two two issues. issues. Come on. <laughs> that's a that's a photo I've never seen before. I'm I'm so I'm so happy to check that out. It's a nice photo. Like getting to see the color in some of these pieces is very very nice. Because he's almost black and white. You know, like that 
that tannish gray sweater, gray hair. It's like, yeah, man. Timber There's some of those colors in there. Timber house. And then you get a couple of glimpses. And this is really kind of an overview of, of Kirby's background and what he's working on now. He's He's gone to the animation, the Ruby Spears animation job, but still making comics. So they talk about Destroyer Duck with Eclipse. And, of course, he's doing Captain Victory with uh, Pacific. So... You know, create our own stuff. Like he's uh, he's done his his job at the overgrounds, and now he's doing some creator own books. I love Kirby so much. I think about him every every day. I, I think of Jack Kirby. I look at something of Jack Kirby's every day just by happenstance in this studio. You know, and uh, this might be one of the most kind of heartbreaking uh, articles I've read uh, in in a, in a multitude of of you know situations where Jack Kirby's wronged and you read about it and because it's where it's it's straight from his lips and you hear rumors and all that sort of thing of about how he was treated by the the youngsters when he comes back to Marvel in like 75 76 and he's talking about how like his own co-workers Mm -hmm. uh are are fucking him up because they're only printing bad letters in in the comics, uh, I forget what he calls. It. He has a, he has like a hit letters or something like yeah. that. He, he's he's got a name for it, and how like his editors and stuff. Like the the basically the the kids who are working at Marvel who were his fans uh, are not doing him any favors by by uh, like the editorial things that they're doing. And sure, you you put enough. Bad, bad, it, like this is you know it's your propaganda tool you know like if you put unanimous bad letters and stuff in there then everybody's gonna like a lot of people are gonna be swayed by that yes a hundred percent and when I started reading comics and looking for Kirby stuff that was the impression I had of the 70s Kirby work like it wasn't very good and you know I that's all I could afford and once I started reading them it was like well I don't know what they're talking about this stuff's great but that was this sort of the stigma, and it does come out of that editorial, you know, whoever it is that was messing with him behind the scenes, making those letters. And you can see that stuff being manipulated, you know, a little over a decade later, whenever, or two decades later, whenever they start the letters in X-Force with the Peter Milligan, Mike Allred stuff, where it's like, this is a place where we can play with our audience. And uh, it's, it's really a shame. Like, that's a story that I've heard from various people about how Kirby was treated by the Marvel staffers in the late 70s, and it's it's disgusting. Yeah, so it, this is the first time I read it, like, straight from Kirby's lips. And talk about, like, he seems like such a sweet guy. Like, when he's talking about doing Destroyer Duck, for no money, uh, by the way, he's like, but what I gained is Steve Gerber's friendship. And, and he seems like he's on the level. He's a nice guy. Like, Jack Kirby seems amazing, you know? Like, such a good soul. And in business, those guys could get taken advantage of and he certainly did. In spite of all of that stuff that we just mentioned, like he doesn't he's not like a psychic vampire character. Like he's not just complaining. Right. You know, he's always forward thinking and he's he's always he's always moving. Yeah, it's these articles too, like I mean, have you read ten thousand pages about Kirby at this point? It's but in nineteen eighty two, like there wasn't that many outlets where you would actually get to see this stuff. To would, see like a biography of a creator or a history of a creator, you know, there just was there just weren't a lot of those. So kinda neat to get that overview and to see that he's still active and has ideas and projects that he's working on. Um it's it's kind of a neat portrait in that way because like here's a guy who's done everything and we have this historical outline to see like even what he was doing in the golden age with kid gangs, Captain America, fighting American romance comics, you know, like career. He, he's, he's got about four careers worth of, uh, of, of material. And now he's doing creator own stuff in the direct market. So it's kind of exciting in that, in that regard. It's, there's that great masters of comic art video that we'll, we're gonna have to do an audio commentary on that one. We got to do one of those vids again. Uh, and he's talking about, uh, you know, first there was the comic, the editorial cartoon, then there was the comic strip, then you added to that a little bit, you had the comic book, and we don't know where, where it's going to go next. Like, he goes to graphic novel, and, and he did that, you know, mm-hmm. he did a 100-pager. Yeah. Yeah, he even did serialized stuff like Silver Star, you know, the, uh, I forget the phrase that he used for it before graphic novel was, was kind of in the lexicon, but it was, like, adapted from one of his screenplays where it was like, yeah, five, six parts, one big story. Mm-hmm. So, pretty cool. 
Remember uh, The Losers? This was a revelation for me whenever I started finding these war comics that he did at DC. Absolutely, yeah. Those are flea market finds for me. Yes. Yeah, the, any kind of war comics I feel like I could find at flea markets. Yeah, that's Must true. Must have been like old uh, old uh, army you know, soldiers or marines or something S- at Red Comics. Such a scam, too, because like, you would get your Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos, and it could have two different covers and be the same issue. Yes. They just they just like reprinted the same <laughs> fucking ones five times. Absolutely. A lot of fourth world talk in this article, too, which is fun. You know, you feel like it's starting to get its reappraisal. Um, there's your Pacific Comics ad, by the way, so... You see, like, what they're doing in these early days. And coming soon, Miss Mystic from Neil Adams. These things, I don't know, man. There's something about seeing them in the present as opposed to, like, me finding them in in back issue bins, like, my whole life. Superhero screenwriters. This is a uh, husband-wife team that are writing Superman 3. And my takeaway from this is their office apartment overlooks Central Park in in, uh, New York City. And I just think, like, what's that real estate cost? And think about the contrast between all the cartoonists that we're looking at in this issue versus uh, the, the people that come along and do screenwriting and, and have that kind of uh, paycheck. When we interviewed Ed Brubaker, like he said something that I never heard uh, and never you know thought thought about or whatever. But he said like you know when you and you'll see like Rob like, like you know Rob ain't talking about this stuff, man. Uh, but like you'll see the creators at the at the. Um, red carpet of a f- film event right and he's like yeah we get the overflow th- theater <laughs> like we created the whole idea the concept and everything and we get to be in the overflow th- theater we don't get to sit there and see uh michael chiklis as it, it, you know w- watch fantastic four w- with with the with the actual cast and stuff like that man and then um what was the other bit that i was thinking uh oh and and like when we were at um that Phoenix, Arizona convention where there was like that green mm-hmm. room for like the celebrities to, to get food. And, and we sort of just bum rushed that and like got, <laughs> got the good, good eats and stuff. Like one of the people who didn't, who, 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 who ate like the regular stuff that was for the Comic-Con people was, um, Chris Claremont. He, he ate wow. the, chi- the chicken fingers and stuff. And there was a fresh, it was, um, Dark Phoenix was out or like, like a flick that was yeah, right. completely adapted no, it was Days of Future Past, like whatever one that had that element in it. So it's like there's this fresh movie out, absolutely built on one of his works, and he has to get the chicken fingers, and he can't get he can't get what Danny Glover and Adam West get to eat. Right, and and uh, Wayne Ferris. One of the times <laughs> that I went back there, that's who uh, Honky Tonk Man was sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, these are cool as fuck, and you could get these at Ides. These um. Chronicles uh-huh. that that Fantago puts out, and the Daredevil one is sick. I was looking for my copy, but I could, just couldn't find it in time. Uh, what's cool about this one, and you know, you could go to Ides and get it for fifty cents or a dollar, is there is a um, Daredevil drawn by Spain Rodriguez. Wow, that, that is shit. cool. Yeah, that, that that alone is worth the the buck. This is the second Fantago ad that we see here, and it's the centerfold, full color, two pages. They must have been uh, selling some books. You know, I'm real curious about Fred Hembeck because he's always been around and he's always been published by every publisher down to even Blackthorn. Mm-hmm. But Chicken and Egg, where's this guy come from? I'm, I'm, I'm so I'm so curious, like how he sort of got his initial foothold. This is my first exposure to him, Fanico. You know, like uh, with the series, I guess. You know, like. It seems like it comes out of fandom. And this, exactly, is, this yeah. is where he, he kind of shows up in a big way. But, like, there's a big, uh, like, a, an omnibus of his stuff that I think Image may have put out the collection. But it, it's got to be 800 pages or something, you know, two inches thick. And uh, you're right about, like, all the Marvel stuff. I have a few Hembeck Marvel books, and I always think, like, we should look at one of these. Like, uh, the Fantastic Four Roast is one that I just recently picked up. But, uh, yeah, he, he certainly pops up. It's a distinct style. Interesting knees. Yeah. So this is more on the screenwriters. Fandom, how to get your letters published. Fair. You can go what through the that heck one. is going on here? This is so funny because they're gaming stuff. Like, if you are female or married or in college, make this clear in your return address. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, write to these comics. Unfortunately, most of these are the ones that just got canceled. But write to these comics that have no readership. You're more likely uh, fewer, less competition. Isn't that so corny? <laughs> like you just want to see your name in print, so go like send a letter to a comic that nobody reads, and you'll get to. Uh, you know, I sort of understand the impulse. Like, the, like you probably share it, man. The first time your stuff got published for real, like that's a, that's a that's a dopamine spike, you know. And I'm addicted. 
I love have seeing new works come out and knowing that they're out in the world. So yeah, I didn't the, think of that, but you're right. That's that's all of social media is like the same impulse of getting your letter in print. Right. Yeah. So so like for the people who don't want to take the time to draw 22 pages and bust their their ass and hurt their back and wrists and stuff like that, pen a pen a letter and say you're a lady. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's strange, but hey, this is still fandom, and I get a sense with an article like this, they're throwing some stuff against the wall. You know, like you even see it in their in their letters column where they're getting like pros to write in on advanced copies and tell us what you think, what works and doesn't in this new magazine. It's a new venture, you know. So uh, a little bit of fandom fan service there for uh, for comics fandom. Some of their favorite letters, they're 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 printing uh, in there and it makes me think that we should do a video about some of our favorite letters in, we should definitely uh, do that in the, in the pages of uh, existing comic magazines it's one of the things i want to do in that hulk grand design collection is reprint some of the have a letters page in there reprinting some of those letters any standouts the way, jim these are uh oh i can't can't give that away <laughs> these are by the person who wrote this it's, oh, it's not it's their favorite letters that they've written. What a corny fuck. <laughs> uh, Carl Barks, man, once again, you know, you have an issue early in the run and you've got Jack Kirby and Carl Barks. Pretty good. Yeah. Is this that Carl Barks book that you showed off yes. before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super interesting. Yeah, they're promoting the uh, the Uncle Scrooge, The Life and Times book. And it's recolored. It's, uh, I think, George Lucas does the intro to it. It's a big deal in that... Production was made on its oversized, weighs seven pounds, they talk about, and collects, I don't know, 20, 20 of his favorite stories. And you can see step by step how they are coloring it, this Australian artist. Um, I should have brought it, and we could have flipped through it a little bit, because it's, it's really different to see, like, an attempt at a high end, almost an art object or a picture book kind of quality production. And it's just so different than, like, any other comics. You know, they're doing blue line style. You know, that's what you're seeing here. And then you put your black line on top of it on a separate layer. So kind of interesting just to see the production part. And whenever they shoot it, they shoot the uh, the art in four colors. You know, it's like photo separations. And then a fifth layer for the uh, line art. Oh, man. So that's the, so that's how it gets all hazy and fucked up by every couple of pages. They talk about some of his oil paintings, the duck oil paintings. Um, at this time, some of them selling for $40,000 because Disney wasn't too happy with him making them. So... <laughs> That had to go through some working out a solution for that, but it does make very rare these paintings, uh, you know, comparably speaking, because they talk about numbers and how this was printed forever. His stories would be printed like in nine different languages and 12 different countries. They credited like 20 million copies, say, uh, you know, an issue because of this like multinational printing and distribution. Uh, just staggering numbers. I, uh, this past week, I, w I went down like a very deep rabbit hole that's divorced from the stuff we usually talk about. I was watching so much stuff about uh, the nine old men from Disney. I was, uh, and I found two beautiful interviews with uh, Carl Barks that was even like later than than this, you know, and talk about his whole career. Uh, and he mentioned the oil paintings and stuff. Uh, like I think they're saying maybe even for that book. There's there's a new story that he wrote. Yeah. And he, so right after he wrote that, like this interview was conducted. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to do a uh, an oil painting that showed like, I don't know, like a Trojan horse or something that was like in the money bin or something. But he couldn't allow himself to do it if he didn't build it into canon. So he like wrote like a little um, idea of like where the horse came from but then in order to get that like he needed more story uh so he, then he wrote a little bit more and then he was like you know what it's not gonna take much more effort to just flesh out a whole script uh, after all these notes i put together just to make it possible for myself to like paint this 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 oil like he really believed in this stuff man he was talking about the, there was a duck comic that had human beings in it uh like like a female spy or something and he's drawn beautiful ladies and he reveals that like i'd so much rather have just drawn comics with humans uh and Sh that's so shocking i know when you think of the quality of the work he produced with ducks <laughs> but when he would talk about the ducks what a pro. it would be like it would be like when like claremont talks about like you know kitty would do this and logan would do that and he calls them by name and stuff like you called them guys like oh yeah he's right. you know, he wasn't a good guy and blah 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 and and uh, Don Rosa 
I was fell down a Don Rosa rabbit hole, and he's talking about like he was showing, dude, in his comic book archive. Don Rosa, I rewatched a video after talking to Brew Baker, in his com in his ar comic book archive. It's part f the four of the video series where they're going showing Don Rosa's house and stuff. He's got this thing that's almost like a, uh, the thing that like the librarian, the push cart that librarians have to like put books back. But except there's a drawer. This drawer is full of completed comics that he made as a kid just full like i'm talking maybe ten thousand pages wow. like that much man like 50 you know books of like one size that are over 100 pages and 20 books of another size and he drew humans with a black nose because he thought that like he was such a Carl Barks fan and saw the dogs and yeah. stuff that would have the black nose that he but he didn't see them as dogs he saw them as people himself wow. Uh, even as a kid, uh, but also Carl Burks in these interviews, he talks about the first of the oil paintings where a guy came and was like, okay, so you can't do comics anymore. Like, like, would you paint this scene in, in oils for me? Carl Burks is like, oh, I can't do that. Like, this is like Disney merchandise. Like we have to talk to them. Got the go ahead for a year to just paint, paint these things and, 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 and sell, sell them off and stuff. And uh, when that one guy sort of revealed, I wonder if it was like Glenn Bray or, or somebody, uh, when that one guy um, revealed to the other people within fandom, I, I, I can almost guarantee it's somebody we know, Russ Cochran, but play, like, like one of these kind of high level fandom dudes, um, the floodgates opened and the requests came in and it was more commissions than he would be able to get done in inside of a year, but... Disney allowed him to keep rocking until some douchebag made a print and sold the stuff. And Carl Burks, even still, like they they gave money to Disney. They they sent money to Disney, and then Disney's like, "Oh, pump the brakes, motherfuckers! Pump the brakes! Like you can't do that." Um, but now they work something out. Like uh, there there will be like lithographs and stuff to come with the book, limited to five thousand, and. You know, with the Marvel stuff that we do and do outside work with the, that kind of shit, like they, it's allowed. You know, there's there's a there's a limit that that can be allowed, and you work that out and stuff. So it's cool to read this because it's not as bad as the legend, where you know, like the 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 way the legend goes is Disney found out he was doing these oil paintings, and they 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 stopped it. They didn't let him do it. It was it wasn't like that. The first off, they let him. Somebody else like ran ran wild, and then they had to protect their trademark, or else you forfeit your trademark. And, I mean, copyright law, or copyright laws are made and broken by the fucking Disney. Yeah, that's so, true. so it's like they're going to be protective of it. Yeah, it's, it's uh, kind of a different time in some ways, but but maybe not. <laughs> maybe the more it changes, the more it stays the same. A lot of tchotchkes, man. I just want to point out the uh, the price on this book they're making. It's $130 pre-ordered and $159.95 after uh, March 1st. And uh, this is $1982. Yeah. So that is a high ticket item. Um, but you know what I was thinking is we should do a video where we look at, you know, I'll bring my copy and we'll compare it to like the Fanographics reprints. Right. And uh, it could be an interesting side by side. This color is like, they're, they're trumpeting that, that colorist guy. That's like gilding the lily. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. But I mean, you know, you you make those advances. It's it's uh, one step back, two steps forward. In that, like, hey, let's treat this like, elevate this above the newsprint and the in the bad printing. Um, you know, it just takes some time to to actually get to the promised land. Yeah, but then you realize that like that original print is is perfect. It's great. Yes, uh, Eclipse Rising. This is a, a history of Eclipse. At this point, I think they're about five years into their run, and uh, kind of talks about the origins of that. Starting out doing high end you know, relatively speaking, high-end graphic novels. And at first it seemed like that would be impossible because it was like six bucks for, uh, you know, for one of these things. But then Sabre sells out its print run of 5,000. And again, the early days of the direct market, you know, it turns out there was a market of people that were interested in this kind of different approach to comics. And so that's how they take off. And uh, at this point, looking at where they're at five years in, they're doing like the Eclipse magazine, I think bi-monthly or quarterly, and uh, getting good response to that cite stuff like uh, Heavy Metal and Epic Illustrated to give it some context. And he's planning to go into producing, like, uh, color comic books. 
And of course, we know that, you know, go find a good dollar bin and you'll see a bunch of eclipses uh, at this point, their future plans. But kind of neat to see, again, it's early direct market, but Eclipse, man, they had a decade run or so in the 80s where, like, if you have an interesting 80s indie comic, there's a good chance it's an Eclipse book. Yeah, I mean, they, they were they were sort of like a a, br- a bridge uh, for for a lot of things, you know, doing those those early magazine format comics, like like the Sabre graphic novel, you know, that's before... They're talking about the Sabre graphic mm-hmm. novel selling out here, and, you know, somewhere there's the Marvel graphic novel number one you know like that comes later and 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 jim shooter in these fucking interviews like i i, I watch everyone that's done man one with uh, the mile high comics guy recently uh and he's like defending that uh marvel did the first you know graphic novel because uh we're the first major publisher like see yeah we still i still hold that distinction like eclipse doesn't count uh, <laughs> but but mo- like the first real serious like manga efforts come through viz's relationship with eclipse yes uh they start to reprint um public domain interesting crime comics and horror comics so it could be the first you know bob powell comics you've ever seen or perhaps the first uh, jack cole comics you've ever seen british reprints with from warrior magazine with a uh, miracle man and uh you know power comics the brian ball and dave gibbons like they they had their hand in a lot of a lot yeah of absolutely 100 percent. and uh and i should say dean mulaney you know yeah. like he's the publisher and he's the, the main guy speaking here also reprints of comic strips they were they were pretty early on in doing uh comic strip reprints and now he does like the american comics library i think i'm butchering that name but yeah. idw uh you know repackaging and reproducing old comic strips and i mean these are those are great books some of my favorite books are those you know one of the projects he did is that alex toth collection of big books that idw has printed that are just phenomenal so uh, you know at this point dean mulaney man a long history in comics and, and high quality comics yeah and i think the publisher of, uh, at uh, idw tad adams was was a eclipse employee yeah, that makes sense. So, with Chris Pitzer. Yeah, Chris Pitzer, publisher of Ad House Books, one of my longtime collaborators, did a uh, did a stint at at Eclipse. So there's the long legacy; it lo- looms large. And you yeah, even see the coaching tree. Yeah, you even see a kind of uh, Eclipse looking logo on like their Euro comics, like the Hugo Pratt stuff that uh, IDW is publishing mm-hmm. right now. It has like kind of like the Eclipse logo but it says euro comic or something like that yeah you're right i never put that together till you said it and now it's like a hundred percent that's right creating the comics part two penciling so this is where uh you know i mentioned john Busima. his name is going to come up again later there's a lot of uh dick giordano in here talking about um you know exactly this the penciling and making distinction between breakdowns and penciling uh you know breakdowns being kind of the first step once you get that script is uh, what does that actually look like on the pages? And, you know, depending on who it is, a valuable penciler is uh, better doing breakdowns so he can do more books. And, you know, when we talked to John Romita Jr., first 10 years of his career, he was doing breakdowns. And to me, that's the storytelling. Yeah. Uh, And I I think that's something that can get lost uh, if the script is too tight. Because it's like, let the visual guy figure out how, how best to show this sequence. It's it's the bane of comics the past 20 years, probably, in, in, in the mainstream. Yes. Um, what about the kid in Duluth? If you're not in New York City, you are at a tremendous disadvantage. Right. And they talk about some of that. Like, even these guys who show up, uh, kind of make their name and then go back to where they're from, Mike Grell being the uh, an example that they use, a lot of assignments are quick turnarounds. And yes. if you're not close, man, it takes two days to mail you this stuff. So you're out. Yeah, yeah. It, it, see, and it's an interesting juxtaposition with the Dean Mullaney conversation because... Because it's a barrier in the mm-hmm. in the mainstream, but Dean Mullaney in the Eclipse interview, he's saying stuff like, "Listen, I live here, wherever he lives. Uh, there might be something amazing happening in, in Wichita, and I don't know you, so we have our eyes open. Like, send us stuff. We're yeah. always keeping our eyes peeled for for fresh comics. It is a good contrast because that's what you got to do. Like, these companies need the talent. They they don't work without somebody doing this, uh, doing the actual production." Uh, talks about like the different genres and how like there'll be different 
different things you need to do stylistically if you're doing a romance comic than if you're doing a superhero. It talks about the superheroes are larger than life, so they should be nine heads tall instead of eight heads. Uh, romance comics being a little bit more subtle. So it's kind of neat to see these little ideas that, like, you know, G Giordano, like, can speak to this as well as anybody. As an editor for, for probably a couple decades at this point, um, it's a really good source for this kind of information, like really telling you some stuff that you need to do if you're going to walk through our doors and get, get work. And uh, I brought this along. There's going to be an ad for this a little bit later on, but this is from about the same time period. Supposedly there are four of these. I've only ever seen this first one. Uh, but it's, you know, it's the an illustrated comic art shop, and they talk about it here like there aren't a lot of resources for this. Uh, how to Draw Comics the Marvel Way, which is really little more than a paid house ad for Stan Lee and John Buscema. <laughs> uh, man, taking shots, cutting promos on the competition. It's true. But uh, I thought I thought it'd be neat to kind of see this. You should, man, this is better paper, by the way, than any comic book was printed on back then. Actually, kind of reminds me of uh, Saber, the first uh, printing of Saber that Eclipse did. But always love these kinds of, let's see the, uh, the shop break down. Like, what are your tools there, your drawing table? Here's what would make this better than how to draw comics the Marvel way in one page. Is there a, a fucking drawn figure where we see some muscles? <laughs> there isn't. Yes. <laughs> there like, isn't. But there's like half of this book is just tools. Look at this, man. This is page 13. Like we're, we're partway through here and it's just tools. They do talk about uh, screens, zip tone and stuff. And um, we're still in tools looking at morgues and reproductive methods, French curves, more on the Polaroid. You're going to need some photo reference maybe for those hard to, hard to reach poses. But here we go. Draw your first horizontal line and now it's perspective time. And good Lord, look at the, the detail of trying to explain perspective to somebody with just uh, these diagrams and stuff. They actually, I think they do a fairly good job. I was reading this stuff the other night and it all makes sense, but it seems so complicated. Imagine you want to draw comics, and this is what, what they hand you. Yeah, right, right, right. It's, it's a little bit overwhelming. Like, I, I couldn't imagine if this was my... If I was 12 and I mailed away to get this book, and then this showed up, I would just be so intimidated. Like, they're casting perspective shadows on the ground. When I went to art school, when I went to the Qbert school... Here's your human figure, by the way. John Romita comes in. So we get John Romita Sr. Uh, breaking down our figures and doing your... See, this is better. Yeah, this is good. This is better than uh, than um, how to draw comics in Marvel way because they wouldn't even do this. You know, like they wouldn't. It's like God forbid you you. It's uh, Reed, us... Reed Richards and Sue Storm. I with, think with and... fully clothed. Yes. <laughs> like that's absolutely better. You know, it's not quite Andrew Loomis, but it's something. And you can see, like, this is where it ends. So you do need those those future volumes. I think if you're really going to get into comics. Gary Brodsky. Yeah. Is this Solson publisher? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Quite a quite a legacy that he's got. <laughs> Go look him up on Facebook, people. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, always wondered what uh, Dick Giordano looked like, actually. Yeah, he looks like an affable guy, right? Sure. You always hear good stories about him. Seems like he's in a good mood in that picture. John Romita Jr. All right. John Romita Sr., I should say. Looks so much like John Belushi in that photo, doesn't he? Yeah, I don't reckon. I only know the old uh, John Romito with the beard and, and those uh, Jeffrey Dahmer-like aviator glasses. But again, like, this is a cool article, and I don't know that future comic scenes go that direction as much. You know, the kind of the how-to stuff, but uh, I do like seeing it. And I guess the first volume, or the first book, had how, how to write. You know, it was a progression. So presumably maybe book three or issue three has inking. Yeah. All right, Ed, this is what we've been building towards, right? The guest spot on creator's rights. I see. John Byrne. I see the pull quote from, from this uh, editorial piece right there. Yeah, it's uh, most of what you need to know right there in yeah. terms of this article. Um, this is what it's about. This is Byrne ruminating on creator's rights. Apparently, that's a very hot topic at this time, and so he weighs in on it. And Kind of, you know, he certainly sides with Marvel, refers to things like we, whenever he talks about the things yeah. that, that happen at Marvel, even before or before his time or stuff he had nothing to do with, but it's part of the company. One of the things that he says is he's all for these creator right ideas like royalties, but then if your project tanks, how about if you give back some money? Right. Right. And, and, and I, like that's, that, that was a big one. He called it creator wrongs. So what about creator wrongs? You know, like this is an investment they're putting in. And, uh, you know, if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, like, uh, are you going to give back some loot? And, and I would suggest that 
you know, the time put into it, like, that you're not going to get back, is you paying for it. Like, uh, you know, you do something for Marvel DC, and it doesn't hit that perennial kind of pay structure. Well, you've given, like, actual, like, your, your human life to the thing. Like, that's plenty. Like, that that's enough. Like, you, you've, you've earned your wage, and you don't know for the long term what's going to happen with that work. You know what I mean? So, so that, that was a specious piece of the argument here. Another specious piece of the argument is when he's talking about the, the pay that Siegel and Schuster got, who he called Hicks from, Mm -hmm. from Ohio. Uh, and, and it wasn't, he wasn't like, I mean, the way I read it is he's calling them Hicks from Ohio. It's not like people see them as Hicks or it's like, like he called them that, uh, yeah, two, two little dumb hicks from the Midwest. Is that in quotes? I don't think it is, right? It's not in quotes. No, no, no. He's th- Those are presumably Burns words. If you assume he wrote this column, that's what he wrote. <laughs> right. So he talks about like uh, the, the pay, like uh, $200, you know, don't, don't be confused or whatever. Uh, $200, that was a lot of money in 1938. We have the internet now. I looked at an inflation calendar, uh, calculator with... Uh, you know, two hundred dollars, and you could put the date nineteen eighty two, nineteen eighty three. Make a guess what what that what that huge amount of money is, and I'll and I'll tell you. Oh man, that's interesting. It's twenty thousand, one thousand three hundred dollars and change. Way less than I thought. Wow. Yes. Wow. I guess nineteen thirty eight, the economy had rebounded to some degree <laughs> from the Great Depression. Man, that's uh, that surprises me a lot. I would have expected it to be far greater than that um yeah it's it's kind of an interesting article Here, here's the other here's i mean there's more to talk about uh he's he's basically saying like hold steady yeah there need to be changes but they'll come and and it's like well somebody has to do the work sir to to make that come mm-hmm. and i get that you know you're you're in a cush position you're in the catbird seat you're selling, you're doing this piece here. You know, your editor-in-chief was the cover guy on uh, the first issue. So you're making nice, you're, you're, you're doing jazz hands and and uh, showing that you're a good company man here. Keep a little job security for yourself. This is the kind of thing where, you know, of course there will never be any kind of union. There will always be scab guys. And, you know, we talked about it before. Like, there's like a very small percentage of people who make money in comics Almost everybody else, like, really kind of do- doesn't. Like, the big percentage of people. By the way, that's true also of basketball. Uh, that's true of music. Right. It's true of a lot of these competitive industries. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, like, those guys are always going to... And I'm not putting, I'm not putting like, Klaus Janssen from our shoot interview in this category of, like, John Byrne. But in our interview with him, he was saying stuff like, oh, everybody's talking about how how the industry is always dying, always dying, and, and I've never seen it. And then I brought up in the piece, I was like, Klaus, you were there for several booms, man. You were working with Frank Miller, like, you did Dark Knight Returns, you did uh, Spawn, like, Batman Spawn, uh, a couple of number ones with, like, Pun- like Warzone, and and he's like, oh, yeah, but don't forget, I did Nightfall, and that's a bit, that, that pays bigger yeah, than right. anything. <laughs> so he was there, like... Uh, so, person like you know, with with the blinders on, some people don't see the the struggles of uh, of comics. Um, but you know, he's like, yeah, they'll do they'll do the work, and and, and it'll it'll uh, things things are going to change. And of course, I would like to have uh, s- some money from a Kitty Pride toy or whatever. Yeah, it, a chunk of the Sprite the movie, if anyone is crazy enough to make it, but not retroactively. I know, like, yeah, just cut yourself off. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting kind of the lines. You know what he's saying there is, hey, I knew going in what our yeah. arrangement was, and I'm not going to suddenly change it. I mean, that feels like a shot at guys like Jack Kirby. Or, right. or Siegel and Schuster, Steve Gerber, or anybody. I mean, you know, we could roll out a list of these people who have had grievances and uh, gone to court over, you know, creator rights. And it feels like that's what, you know, who he's aiming at there. That's a big thesis of this entire piece, man. Like, we've we've known about this exact stuff for decades. We signed the contract. And, and to some extent, like, yeah, sure. Let's not have any more of this, you mean the rules that have been in effect for the last 40 years applying to me crap? Yeah, he's he's definitely uh, 
that's what he's saying there. He talks about this Silver Surfer one shot that he's doing with Stan Lee and how early on that was a big deal and people were expecting it to sell well. And he tried to, uh, he asked Jim Shooter about, hey, can I get royalties on this as opposed to a page rate? And Shooter said, no, we can't do that, but uh, I'm going to try to get you a bonus if it sells the way we think it's going to sell. It doesn't sell that way. <laughs> Once the first sales are in, uh, no, they aren't anywhere near what was expected. So, you know, he, he doesn't get that bonus, but had he gone that royalty rate, he would have made less than his page rate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's the risk in his, in his mind of like how to make this balance. And it made me think like, this is the image comics deal. Yeah. You know, like I don't get paid on street angel until street angel makes a certain amount or earns out or, you know, whatever the case is. And it didn't at first, you yeah. know, like I didn't get anything for the first, uh, you know, in the beginning because it wasn't, it did not sell enough to warrant that. So, um, it does, it does make me think of that. Like we are kind of this world he's describing. There is a model of that out there and it's a pretty healthy one image. I think the third biggest uh, comic book publisher in America. And, uh, it's pretty much the system he outlines here. You mentioned stuff like music and things. I mean, that's, that's what made, made Jay-Z a, a, bil a billionaire. He got turned down from record companies, record labels with his first album. So they had to produce it themselves. You get instead of the 10%, you get 90% and, you know, like the, the gravy train starts rolling. All you have to do is be right. You know, you just have to be right. And in terms of right, uh, in this case is uh, units sold, financial success, you know, like uh, distribution. I say runs. it a lot and, and I know that it's hard to make money in comics, but I say it all the time. Like we have more ways of monetizing it or funding that project or bringing it to uh, readers than ever before. And, you know, you look at like those print on demand Amazon things that Rick Veach is doing and Steve Bissett is doing. And I believe the royalty there is like a 60, 40 split to the creator. Mm -hmm. So again, you got to sell them, you know, 60% of zero is zero, but 60% of a thousand books is much better than, uh, you know, 8% of, uh, 5,000 from, from, you know, maybe a bigger publisher. So yeah. Yeah, it's in, it's a lot to weigh in to to consider, but in terms of creator rights, I feel like we have come to a point where like there are a lot of options for the creator, and you just you know do your best to educate yourself, do your due diligence, and and you know experiment a little bit, see what works for you. The gig does not stop after the cap goes on your little micron pen. Yeah, not at all. Uh, the, now you got to put on you know the the salesmanship hat, get the stuff out there. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and sell some fucking books unless you are one of those like rare examples of like the, the work is just so strong and people just speak about it so much that, that it sells like th those people exist and you're probably looking at those people, but that's the exception. Who is that? Yeah. Who is that? Cause I, I, I hear people say this stuff and I haven't met that person. I also haven't met the guy who's so talented. They don't have to work hard. Right. <laughs> like I, you know, these things just don't exist. There are people that are massively talented there are books that have huge word of mouth but i don't think they happen you know it's it's you still have to do all those steps to get there yeah you know that's where that's where kayfabe comes in and stuff because like when you say you say that like the first the first thing that came comes to mind is like chris ware but then i'm like oh no he sells his stuff it's just the character he plays on tv is like the self-effacing nebbishy navel gaze kind of character but but he still does the interviews and he still has the documentary camera crews coming to the studio and all that kind of thing. I think of Walking Dead, the most successful, profitable comic in history. It didn't sell much in the beginning. Kirkman's a hard worker. Like, He's a very hard worker, salesmanship. but he built that audience. Yeah. You know, like that audience wasn't there the day after Walking Dead was published. Yeah, yeah. But that's ne that's never cited as like the thing that just comes out of nowhere. Like you, you meet Kirk, like how many stories do we have of like a young Kirkman just clinging on like a barnacle to Eric Larson and those guys, man. You know, like, of course he was going to become a, a partner at Image. This is uh, Jim Henson's Muppets getting the daily comic, daily and Sunday comic treatment by uh, a couple of brothers, Ga Guy and Brad Gilchrist, and, uh, or Gilchrist. And, uh, and they talk about the whole experience of how they built this thing. And you talk about hard work. They, they had been toiling around doing different comic stuff, doing stuff for the Xerox Education Publications Weekly Reader, by the way, the print run of that over three hundred thousand. Yeah, sure. Um, pretty pretty good for something that no no comics fans sitting around going, yeah, man. Do you guys remember the Weekly Reader? Right. <laughs> but you know there there were these other outlets for uh, for comics back back in the day, and there still are today. 
But, uh, you know, these are guys who wanted to make comics. They were working hard. They had struck up a friendship with Mort Walker, who eventually connected them to uh, Jim Hansen's people, who was looking to do a comic strip. And so they did their, uh, like, like 20 samples and didn't hear much and kept doing more. Did, like, another 100 or something, you know, and they just kept doing these while they were waiting to hear back from from uh, Jim Henson's people. And I feel like that's such the story. Yeah. You know, like, what are you doing? We've got we've got a couple months where we don't hear from him. Keep working. Keep plugging away at this. The other piece that I really liked, they talk about how they approach these characters as, like, caricatures of the Muppets, uh, you know, as opposed to, say, a photo reference or something like that, or taking the Polaroids that we see in the uh, how-to guide. So a lot of little bits of cartoony kind of like how to in this article that I, that stood out to me. My takeaway is that, uh, we just like scratch the surface on what we know ab- about the comic strips that are out there. Cause this was not, this was probably in like five papers or something like that. Like wrong. This launched with over 500 daily and Sunday newspapers. The next biggest launch was 200 in 1973 <laughs> for, uh, Hagar the Horrible, like the the push for this was huge. I don't know how long it lasted, but the initial launch was was the biggest ever. And I do wonder, like, what the what the impetus for this kind of stuff? Because because there would be like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle strips. There there were. Um... I think you had to try it. I think that the machine behind the comic strips were such that if you had something that fit that, you had to try it. Because if it worked. I mean, the profits just yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, but I, but I think like the impetus for that must must have been like the peanuts paperback, like you know some some extra piece, like maybe the Garfield paperback, perhaps maybe the peanuts. Like some, they had some newspapers in big markets bidding against each other for who got this comic strip. That's so funny. You know, like I think even those books and stuff are the spinoff of like you have five hundred newspapers bidding for the rights to this thing. There's some money there. Yeah, sure. And what would you say, man? This looks very uh, Walt Kelly inspired, at least in terms of the lettering. Definitely, Walt Kelly is one of the uh, one of the big influences that he cites. Um, kind of a fun influence list, but I don't I don't see it right in front of me here, unfortunately. But Walt Kelly is definitely one of the uh, three or four guys that they name as being the big influence on their style. So good eye there, Ed. All right, and I think getting near the end here. This is the Howard Cruz. Uh, article that I mentioned earlier, and he is profiling Marvin Tannenberg, an artist that I don't know, but a guy who had a career for like a decade, went away from comics and then came back. And these are his like comeback comic strips. And he kind of talks about his journey, uh, had an eye issue for a couple of years where like literally he couldn't draw, uh, went through a divorce. Basically, it's him changing as a person and then returning to comics and uh, and sort of uh, the struggle to find, like, his voice in comics. So kind of interesting. You know, these articles where one cartoonist profiles or interviews another cartoonist, you get that insight of maybe questions that the uh, the fan wouldn't necessarily come to or the journalist that doesn't have that background. It's the strength of uh, cartoonist kayfabe. Yes, absolutely. And here's your ad for the uh, the Illustrated Comic Workshop. That was a kayfabe mail item, by the way, so thank you, uh, whoever sent that in. And next issue, on sale March 16th. So I guess technically this is a February uh, 1982 issue. Um, You know, cover dates are weird. How about this? Stolen Valor! (laughs) Stolen Valor! Dude, look at those things look like uh, like plastic or foil. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, that was the era, man. Like, uh, how jealous of you, how jealous were you when you would see those, like, space camp videos and shit that yes. they would show at school and stuff, man. Like, you wouldn't be in that little gyroscope, like, spinning around yeah. <laughs> and trying to, trying to hold hold your blood it, it, throughout uh, your brain. No doubt. Yeah, those are, those are kind of amazing. Part of that crossover crowd, too, like, who's into this stuff? Yeah. And here's your star log, like, the kind of uh, things that are being produced by this same publisher. I love this shit so much, man. It speaks to production, because one thing about comic scene... Better production than almost any comic stuff you're going to get at the time because of this. It's because true. Because it's coming from the magazine world. I saw uh, there were like, you know, when Star Wars was such a big deal and they were sh- they were shooting, you know, Empire Strikes Back or something. I remember seeing this one photo spread in an old Star Log where these people would st- like like night crawlers, like Jake Gyllenhaal's of sci-fi would basically stock like Lucasfilm and stuff and then like just m- mirror all the stuff they did. So like, well, they're going to Tunisia, like. We need to get a fucking ticket to Tunisia, and and they were like traveled, and it was it's the wow. furthest fucking telescopic lens kind of photos of like <laughs> the 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 barge like the from from uh, 
the the skiff barge thing with like Lando and Bob, Boba Fett and stuff. It's as far as can be, man. The way that these people were like sort of kept back on like five sand dunes away from where they were filming. But like those are the only the you know you get those pictures and you could put a big exclusive from the set of Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of extra zeros you get to add when you're the only person that has a photo of it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's <laughs> sci-fi paparazzi. Exactly, man. All right, so there's a comic scene number two, and uh, I imagine we'll look at more comic scenes. This this is a magazine that I'm a fan of and have a few issues. This was too good, man. This this was too good of a magazine, and and uh, like I've been wanting to do like a Jack, the Jack Cats one. Yes. Uh, so fuck, we're definitely gonna have to do some more. You good to go? I am. K Fabers, like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, we'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design. It will be in your stores this month. Pick that up. If you haven't already pre-ordered it, tell your store you want a copy because they may still be able to get you one. And uh, patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Red Room Trigger Warnings. Issue 1 is on the stands today. Uh, issue 2 going to be on the stands in April as well as uh, the second uh, Hulk Grand Design. Uh, you can read these comics on my Patreon before they hit paper, uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Every issue is completely self-contained. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics, and it'll be coming out on a monthly basis until, uh, until you know, we hit issue number four. Uh, hit those link trees in the description below this video to get to all of our extra stuff. What else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Jimmy, give them the marching orders. We'll be on our way. Make more comics.